So in my last video, I mentioned I had lots of complicated feelings about like various like different kind of bus seat covering and I thought the best way to kind of explore this would be like a brief history of London buses. Um, buses have been around since the 19th century, horse-drawn ones. I'm limiting this to like internal combustion engine buses that are in like wide usage. So really from just before World War One to date, so 110 or so years. Um, and I guess we should get started. Um, first off, we need to uh, don our little captain's hat to get some run because we are entering the age of pirates. Uh, World War One had an interesting effect on London. Um, lots of buses were used overseas um, for transporting people, um, used often as ambulances, but as troop carriers, some even they managed to mount vickers on. Some real wild shit went on in World War One. Um, but anyway, <laughs> these kind of um, shortage of actual London buses made by the London General Omnibus Company, um, which is kind of a state-run, privately owned kind of business, like like Greg should really be. But um, like the London Omnibus Company had a huge shortage, and this got people thinking. Um, now, tube lines are hard; they're monopolies. Naturally, um, you've got one set of rails; you can't put a tube train on it. However, um, in like roads, roads are there. Anyone with a bus can do it. Um, and so, if you see in the bottom, these like chocolate expresses started to rise. This was one of the most famous um, pirate buses. They used to have some very shady business practices. London buses um, followed routes pretty much everywhere. They weren't very, very profitable. Um, pirate buses, on the other hand, had this real habit of running only the most profitable routes and often literally racing London buses to get there. They were they um, they would often be fitted with engines that were too big and were prone to overheating. They would often cut routes short if they didn't think they were being profitable enough. They would often like, bear in mind this is like 1910s, 1920s London, they were like old Victorian alleys that could not support a bus and they would race through these to beat London buses point to point um, just to try and get passengers. They would also like try and undercut them on price but that didn't work too well because the like London General was just hugely, hugely state subsidised. Um, then in 1924 there was the London um, and Home, Co Home Counties kind of traffic act and this this outlawed um, pirate busing. Um, it didn't outlaw other buses running in London. What it did was it outlawed like all of the like dangerous practices so like point to point racing, um, steering off routes and like um, stealing other routes effectively but pirate buses um, were did really keep going until 1930s um, in the 1930s um, the kind of predecessor for like Transport for London was formed um, and they kind of said okay no London buses are like essential enough they should now be state run and they, they fully outlawed them um, unfortunately as a result there aren't many surviving moquettes um, from the era from pirate, pirate buses um, and they just varied, like these were often, a lot of pirate buses were kind of syndicated, but they were often like one man kind of jobs, and that was that was dangerous. Um, it would literally be a guy just running running a bus, he could, he could afford a bus, and he just, just kind of ran it, or um, much like taxi cab firms and mini cab firms work, you would you'd rent your bus um, and kind of lease it and pay it off while running the service. It was, it was not a good system, and we, Luckily, they outlawed it, and, and by by the 1930s, it was dying down. Um, pirate buses had a brief resurgence in World War II. It was much, much more limited, though. Um, there was the same bus shortage, um, not because buses were being used overseas. There weren't any um, double-deckers sort of storming the beaches in Normandy, but there was um, like a real shortage of those materials. A lot of buses were stripped down, and their metals recycled, and so on and so forth. Problem was, was London was just bombed to shit and Transport for London were doing their best to kind of keep it going and they really did keep London moving during the war um, and I keep calling Transport for London, London Transport and all of its kind of predecessors, I'm just going to lump them all in together. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the age of piracy. I had a brief resurgence in the Second World War but really after kind of 1933-1934 it sort of ran out. They, the brown bus um, at the bottom was kind of like one of the last, um, it continued to run um, into the 30s. It's now in a museum in the Acton Depot London Transport Museum, which I would thoroughly, thoroughly recommend going to. As I said, we don't have a lot of market shards for um, real old kind of pirate buses, but this was a kind of lozenge design that was 
used on a lot of things actually, but it was used on buses, trams, trolley buses, which we'll come to in a bit, but it was like one of the first kind of standardised early London general ones. They commissioned it. Um, it's light, it's nice geometric design. Problem with it being light is it faded a lot. Um, buses chucked out a lot more shit and had open staircases. Um, and yeah, it was really, really nasty. Um, they, they often went brown very quickly, like this sample, this sample is held in a like vacuum chamber in a museum as far as I understand or like a really high nitrogen atmosphere one one where, one where it can't decompose um and yeah you can imagine like such a light kind of thing in really like sooty disgusted leaded petrol conditions um yeah um we should move on from like early buses to talk about this bus um this came along in the 30s it's the AEC um don't ask me what it sound for I, I guess it's like automotive something and then carriage works probably i didn't google it learning's problematic i'm not doing it um but this was the regent one it was um as you can see one of the first buses to have an internal back staircase or a partially um you can see it kind of juts out on the back um before this as i sort of showed you in the age of piracy slides um back steps were exposed which is great until it rains or it's great until someone falls off it or it's great until until a lot of bad things happen like like there was like a non-zero amount of serious, serious injuries caused in like the 20s and 30s, all by this being like, all by these kind of exposed staircases. Um, and yeah, we we find this bus. This was the first one. There was a fleet of about three, 400 ordered um, by London General, which was a lot at the time. Um, yeah, you can see the little crank at the front. Um, they, they still have a, you can see like a protruding driver's cab, so passengers don't sit all the way up front as kind of modern double-deckers have. It's still what's called like a bonnet design where the driver is shoved out front with the engine and everyone else is behind. Um, just means you can fit a few less passengers and the engine's kind of out front. Um, yeah, but it did allow for like better engine cooling. Um, so, that's one of the more kind of interesting early examples of buses um but the kind of most fun thing you can do with a bus is to strip it out and turn it into trolley buses um all trolley buses are is rather than having an internal combustion engine you have a giant electric motor and um you run pantographs like a train or like a tram um to draw power um still have um rubber tires the advantage of this was you didn't need to dig tram tracks in a lot of very old roads um you didn't need to like tear the roads up you just swung some wires and you can see here there's barely even lampposts supporting these wires they're often just strung between guttering on like houses and like government owned buildings and like bits and bobs like any any building that that was along these streets would be expected to like host um trolley wires they obviously wouldn't be expected to power them that'd be obscene but like yeah they 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 sort of strung off that um yeah trolley buses started in the 30s around the same time this image here was from the um, 1940s um you can sort of see that it's much more kind of Route Master esque. I'm not going to say Route Master because it's very much not a Route Master, um, but much more Route Master esque with the completely enclosed back stair, hop on, hop off, and um, towards the front you can you can't really see from that image, but the driver's cab is much further back and passengers sit much further forward. It's kind of allowed for buses to be shorter while kind of keeping the same capacity. Um, so trolley buses um, by TfL were treated. Uh, TfL just London transport um, were treated pretty much the same way as any other um, bus in terms of seat design um, in fact they were often the same chassis um, and just a different powering system so we can see there's some interesting trolley bus mochettes so this one this one here this kind of like geometric blue design it's dark so it hides a lot of dirt well it does a good bit of light on it as well interesting pattern almost looks like a little like um, what do they call them start flags um, finish flags at the end of like Formula One races, um, and this one is just in Anne's curtains. Um, is entirely just just like or like you know those like really like you go into like a if you ever been around like viewing like a really like old person who bungalow. This is for wallpaper. Um, yeah, it's it's very much of its time. It's it's quite a nice design, like leaves and like nature. It's kind of a bit light, so like I said, not super practical for seat coverings. I I'm fully fully a proponent of um like really dark um geometric shapes this is light and kind of a nature motif um so trolley buses um existed until fairly recently actually 1960 uh 1961 was the last one in service um and sorry i'm just like frantically checking my notes um to not get the dates wrong because you know bus people will at me i'm sure um there are 
a couple of like interesting anecdotes about it. So the last trolley bus was going into the Ilford depot, right in East London. Um, Ilford is East London. I'm not going to start some spicy is Ilford Essex discourse. Um, Ilford in East London. Um, the last trolley bus was coming in on the 8th of May. It was a night service, so it was. It, but trolley buses didn't run that late. It was used to come in about half ten. Um, and everyone had been told this is the last trolley bus. And trolley buses were so loved around this region. They were so, like, adored by people. They were such a good mode of transport. They were clean. They were fast. They were faster than the tube. And they went, they went to places the tube would never consider going. And they were, they were often very cheap. Um, and they were even cheaper if you just hopped on and hopped off at the back. Um, they were free if you did that. Um, but anyway, it was so, like, adorned with people, this route, that the route didn't actually finish until about 2 in the morning on the 9th of May. It had been due to arrive late in the evening on the 8th. It arrived in on the 9th of May. Um, there were that many people just kind of blocking the path to it. Um, but yeah, that's the 60s. So we're kind of getting ahead of ourselves a bit because we need to go to 1954 and the first route master. Um, made by... a. Um, AEC, I believe there were lots of kind of variants of it, um, but they they are one of the longest service bus serving buses in the world. These nineteen fifty four models can still be seen, or at least some nineteen sixties retrofits of the nineteen fifties models on London roads today. Um, the Route fifteen um, or the section of Route fifteen that runs from Tower Hill to Trafalgar Square, best sightseeing bus in London, runs Route Masters, and it costs how much like a bus single cost, which is about pound fifty. Um, God, that's going to make me sound dated if I haven't got a bus in London in like seven years and have no idea how much they cost. Um, but anyway, Route Masters were made in 1954. Um, they, were, they were only built for 12 years. Um, and then sort of London, they became such a kind of iconic symbol of London that they just retrofitted the shit out of them. They were really hardy. They, they could take new engines. They could have their seats stripped out. And the... Route Master, unlike a lot of kind of regional services that fend to London, they decided it needed like a distinctly London feel to it, and that meant having like a standardised commissioned moquette, um, which is where we come to kind of the first kind of one. Well, my my hot take here is the first good moquette, which is the early Route Master ones. This lovely like kind of almost tartan esque design, um, red and black with like gold and blue highlights, really geometric, nice and dark, so again doesn't show up, and. It just looks lovely inside, nice wooden flooring in, in the old Route Masters. It goes really well with that. Um, this one has a nice cream ceiling. Someone painted it different colours. Um, yeah, the mirrors weren't put on initially on the stairs. You would often fall down into people coming up. They'd station a guard down there, but most of the time they couldn't afford to run these routes with a guard on it. So you could just kind of get on and get off at the back for free. Although, you know, be good. Pay fares, don't do crimes. Um... It also had the nice benefit of like route masters. I still remember doing this as a kid of if you were on a bus route that you knew went past exactly where you wanted to go and you'd stop the traffic lights, you'd just kind of jump off the traffic lights, um, get yourself nearer to your destination. Don't get that on Boris buses anymore, um, which is a shame. Um, but that's kind of the interior of um, one of the early route masters. Um, and route masters dominated um, London buses, um, like absolutely dominated them, especially in kind of central London. Um, we're going to talk about it in a minute, but like during the seventies and eighties, like the London transport network kind of need to expand out, um, taking away from like regional bus services and becoming very much London bus services, even zone five, zone six kind of areas. Like they they need to up capacity, and unfortunately, had stopped making route masters at this point. Um, but for kind of the core services, um, and especially the ones that like tourists would see and the kind of ones that ran right to the centre of London, route masters were sort of really used right until they were decommissioned in like the early 2000s but we do come on to the 1970s um the 1970s had interesting bus choices um as i said there was a real need to kind of reach for suburbs um and kind of supply the suburbs that had sort of I'm, I'm not gonna say newly incorporated into london london sort of great london expansion happened 50s and 60s really spread out kind of london um but in order to reach them, they needed a kind of new generation. And this is kind of a Metrobus Titan. Um, they're boxy. they kind of vaguely route master inspired. No backloading, so you can't get on or off as you please. In fact, you can't you can't really fare evade at all on them, um, which sort of sucks. Um, and these were kind of the first of the kind of new generation of buses. You'll still see buses that look fairly similar to this going around most of the UK now. Uh, between the 70s and 90s, this sort of style of bus really didn't change. Um, I'm mostly focusing at the moment on double-deckers. Um, 
because I'm a child. Um, I love double deckers. I love sitting at the front of a double decker and pretending I'm driving the bus because really that's what you're doing. Anyone who sits at the front of a double decker bus, we thank you for your service. Um, you are a key worker and I'm so glad you've been able to get out in this pandemic time. Um, and unfortunately within the kind of 1970s, they did do one thing right. As much as slightly the Metro Bus Titan, they had this absolutely banging market, this sort of jazzy kind of geometric patterns. It might look familiar to anyone who's a fan of the 1970s district line because it is the same market. They loved it so much that they decided to like run with it on a whole load of lines. Um, yeah, very, 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 very good. Um, it looks jazzy, it looks very 70s. It's like the very kind of British 70s. It wasn't, it wasn't kind of a, a very hippie vibe to it. It was just a, it was a, it was a British kind of 70s funky vibe. Um, I'm here for it, to be honest. Really enjoy Metro Buses. Um, and we're gonna jump forward. Um, I've sort of given it away, but slide of jumping forward to the early 2000s to the bendy buses, because buses, like I said, between kind of the Metro Bus and the 90s really didn't change that much, or didn't change in a way that I found interesting enough to research. Um, Ken Livingston um, decided that, you know, as he was turning London into the, the kind of new caliphate or the new communist state, depending on which part of the Daily Mail you read, um, he would subcontract out more buses to Arriva, and they bought these lovely Mercedes Bendy buses. Um, they had a bad, bad habit of catching fire. In three months between um, sort of the end of two thousand and three and beginning of two thousand and four, they had a bus fire every month. It was it was not good. I'm I'm sure many people died, and Bendy buses are bad. Um, the inside of them is a like fairly kind of generic regional kind of moquette. It's bluish, I'll show you on the next slide. But the most interesting thing about Bendy buses is they were still in service until about 2014. We, London buses sold them to Malta. Um, you'll see in that kind of middle photograph. Um, that's not a London street. And trust me, if a Bendy bus is catching fire in freezing London winters, it is not going to do well in like 35 degree Mediterranean heat. And here's the inside, it's a horrible regional bus. I don't want to talk about it, it's disgusting. I don't like it, I don't like the kind of blue swirls. It doesn't feel like a London bus, it could be anywhere in the world. Um, we have skipped forward, back we go. Uh, we jumped to 2011 and the Boris bus. Um, London had a surge of money coming for the Olympics. Um, so I decided to subcontract out more buses because TfL can't run buses. So Arriva runs it, which is owned by Deutsche Bahn, of course, um, as that bus makes plainly, plainly clear clear this is a boris bus it is a good successor to route master it doesn't have the hop on hop off but it does have the back doors so you you can kind of get off the back and pretend that you're jumping off where you actually want to jump off not a bus stop um has nice tap on tap off functions in all of it um, like i said route masters are still running today on like a very few limited lines this is a good replacement good capacity do enjoy riding them i think some of them are even fully electric now but they're definitely hybrid buses um yeah but what I love about Boris buses is their moquette. Um, their moquette is kind of in keeping with the black and red geometric shapes, but not entirely. You'll see I put two bits, so the one on the right is like the bum part and that's your back part, and they're swirly, they're cool. Um, they, they are also a moquette that has a different bum and back part, which I like, which not many moquettes have. So it kind of has this like ergonomic 3D kind of look, um, as you can see here. Um, I like them. I think they go well with the interior. I don't like the like wood effect plastic they use for back stairs. If that is real wood, it's very plasticky wood. I don't think it is. I think it is just plastic. Um, but that is a Boris bus um, interior. Um, I quite enjoy it, and you can clearly see like the echoes to like as I showed you earlier, like the old Route Masters with obviously like tap on tap off added and like appropriate disability allowances and like broad improvements. They are like the one good thing Bojo did um, in his time as mayor of London. And we're going to end on a downer. Um, this is a just generic um, London bus fitted in 2013. It is a boring blue moquette. A lot of the subcontractors don't, that don't run Route Masters don't have any kind of style guide. They can run pretty much what they like. They have to have TFL branding around the place, but there's no kind of enforcement of seat covering like design in the same way like Route Masters have to have that Boris bus. Um, look to it. Um, what I'm what saying, Boris Bus look, Route Master look to it. You know what I mean, that nice red and black geometric, the real standardized hark back to early Route Masters. This, this sucks. Um, this, this could be anywhere. I see buses around my way in Essex that look like this. I see like buses everywhere I go. I've been to Birmingham, and there are buses that are near identical to this, um, without the TFL branding. London buses have been such an institution that I think, to be honest, there should be 
a kind of standardized style and it makes you feel like you're in london um yeah that's that's my broad take on it i think modern these modern moquettes suck which is kind of opposite to the direction the train moquettes are going in which they're kind of going back to unique trains and they're kind of re-experimenting this is just going to whatever reva thinks is cool which i don't know i wouldn't trust a reva to run a bus service so that's kind of the end of the video like share comment ride a bus i don't know but this has sort of been a quick introduction from the kind of age of kind of piracy um the kind of wild west of London buses where people did fucking it whatever they wanted to the age of subcontracting where CEOs do whatever they wanted yeah that's pretty much it